So after Zuckertort won game 3 of the Vruches Championship 8086 in a very shocking fashion after Steinitz wandered everything in a winning position, suddenly the tables have shifted, uh, psychological advantage was in Zuckertort's favor very significantly, and uh, going into the fourth game he would have the black pieces and the big question was whether he would be able to capitalize on that psychological advantage or whether Steinitz would be able to bounce back. Let's find out and see what happened. So, in the fourth game, Steinitz had the white pieces and he opened with e4, as mostly in the career and also as in game 2. But after e5, knight f3, knight e6, this time Steinitz deviated from d4, which he played in the previous game, and he played bishop to b5, going for the rule of pass. And here it was an interesting moment, because Zuckert had played this move knight to f6, leading to the so-called Berlin defense. Now, in this day and age, the Berlin defense is very well known, it has been introduced or made popular by Kramnik in 2000, when he used it with great effect to defeat Gary Kasparov in a match, and there was, the impression was that up to that match, nobody really understood the significance and the power of the Berlin defense, everybody thought it's cramped and bad, but Kramnik almost single-handedly changed and overturned that evaluation. However, I didn't personally know that uh, the history of the Berlin defense, that it was actually played a lot uh, by some players in the past, and including Zuckertort. So when I checked the database, I saw that Zuckertort actually played it uh, 40, um, in 48 games in his career, and only 21 times he went for the other main move, A6, which is very, very, very surprising. But, so, yeah, it was kind of ahead of the time, so it was interesting to uh, analyze these games uh, from that lens. So after knight f6, uh, Steinitz went for castles, knight e4, and now the move d4 is the like the main move that leads to the infamous endgame after knight to d6, bishop takes e6, d takes e6, d takes e5, knight f5, queen d8, uh, king d8. This is like one of the most theoretical positions in modern chess, uh, with a lot of theory and books and everything. It was featured in world championship matches, uh, every super tournament, it's seen all the time. But rook e1 is one possibility to avoid this endgame. And after knight to d6, knight to e5, uh, white is threatening this discovered check on the check, uh, king, so you can't take the the knight, uh, the, the bishop on b5 because of knight c6. And after knight e5, uh, rook e5, bishop e7, now the bishop has to retreat, so bishop f1, castles, d4, bishop f6. And now there are quite a few possibilities here, once again, uh, bishop d3 is actually possible, trying to sacrifice an exchange, rook e2 is also a possibility, and so on, but rook e1 is the most natural move, retreating. The, the rook. Now one of the reasons why this Berlin defense is considered this solid is now it features the same symmetrical pawn structure and uh, we can see both sides have four pawns on the queen side and three pawns on the king side and usually when there is symmetry in the position it makes it much more difficult for one side to do something because there are no pawn pushes, no pawn breaks, no ways to undermine the structure, it's just pure symmetry. I mean, of course, that doesn't mean that the position should be an automatic draw, but these uh, structures that also arise from, let's say, Petrov, from French exchange, they ha do have drawish tendencies. Now black is challenging the rook on e1, white played c3 defending uh, the d4 pawn. Later it transpired that they can sacrifice, sacrifice the pawn on d4. This is more modern approach. I will, I will give it in the nose, but c3 is like more sensible or more obvious. Rook e1, queen e1, knight to f5. Now black wants to play d5 next and kind of gain some space in the center and reach a very much um, symmetrical uh, structure. So here white prevents it with this clever move bishop f4. The idea is if d5, now we have this bishop c7 trick and the queen can't capture because queen e8 is mate. So d6 has to be played preventing bishop c7. Knight to d2 bringing the pieces, bishop e6, bishop d3. And now knight to h4. The idea of this move is to play knight g6 and kick this bishop away. It's also possible to play in different ways. For example, bishop g5 was seen in some very high profile games, for example, between Anand and Rajabov in Vikanzi 2019. So you can see that this was a very, very modern game for 8086 standards. So knight h4, knight e4, knight g6, bishop d2, d5. And now, finally, black manages to play this d5 under reasonable circumstances, gain shared space and basically neutralize white's slight uh, uh, advantage in the activity because in these positions white does have the win in development but if they can't do anything with it and it's hard to do so when your opponent doesn't have any clear uh, weaknesses then uh, it's hard to count on any advantage now the knight is attacking the pawn on b7 and the bishop on e6 but bishop c8 protects the pawn 
queen to e3, b6, kicking the knight away, knight b3, and now queen to d6 was played, which is a little bit weird to me, like why give this option of playing queen to e8? Maybe it was more natural to play like bishop to e6 or something. I'm not 100% sure what was the point of this move, to be completely honest, but okay. So queen e8 was played, knight to f8. Maybe Zuckertal was uh, planning to play bishop b7 and kick the queen away, but in the meantime, uh, White will play rookie one, get full control over the only open file, that's the e-file. And uh, yeah, the bishop will, I think, be maybe even more passive than on e6. It's, it's hard to tell. So rookie one, bishop e7, queen e3, knight e6. I mean, once again, in these types of positions, like even if you make small inaccuracies, like you're, it's not like such a critical position because, uh, yeah, the prop, black is very solid from the beginning. But sometimes the, these small inaccuracies can like pile up and then you're suddenly in a much worse position. Um, for example, here another idea was rook d8 to play uh, rook d7 and then rook e7 and to fight for the open file. Because if black manages to exchange all the heavy pieces on the e file, then they should be like, uh, this should be a pretty clear draw because without heavy pieces, there really is no way to, to do anything in the symmetry. So knight e6. Queen f3, this was a very nice idea, trying to maybe get the queen to f5, play against the king side. Rook d8, queen f5, not f8, bishop f4. So black is making some, uh, white is making some progress, as you can see, as the pieces are becoming more active. But still, black is very solid. Queen to c6, knight to d2. So this is also a very good move. The knight is not doing much on b3, so Steinitz improves the piece. This is the so-called principle of improving the worst place piece. Uh, after bishop c8, uh, this is also a very good move. Now, but now we can see that this whole idea of placing the bishop on b7 was a little bit weird because now the bishop will go to e6 or to this diagonal in the end. Queen h5, g6, queen to e2, knight e6, bishop g3. I think somewhere around this point, maybe white should have also considered. So usually in these types of symmetrical structures, uh, white at some point has to push on the king side to create some problems. Maybe somewhere around here, maybe instead of this queen f5, maybe it was time to maybe consider pushing uh, the pawn. So the what sign is, uh, this was also quite logical. So after queen to 2 knight e6, bishop g3, queen to b7. Uh, this is objectively not probably the best move, but it, it actually turns out to be good enough uh, to pose concrete problems. Um, Probably possibly better is to play knight g7 and then to prepare bishop f5 to try to exchange some pieces because black should be aiming for, for, for equality. With bishop queen b7, black is preparing c5 and playing more ambitiously, but objectively it's not uh, not correct or not fully correct. It, but practically it definitely is. So, But after knight f3, c5 was played and now we have this culminating moment of the game. So we can see that the pressure on d4 is at its peak. And in the game, actually, Steinitz made the first mistake. Uh, he took on c5. What Steinitz probably should have done, like, okay, their first phase. There, there is one tactical way, the engine way, which is queen to d2. Uh, the idea is simply to, after cd4, cd4, knight d4, knight d4, bishop d4, to play bishop a6. And after queen to a6, queen to d4, you have all the dark squares in the world. And actually, Black has uh, very much many problems with the weakness of the king, like queen f6 and bishop f5 are threat, uh, and it's actually not, and the queen is also sidelined here on a6. So this actually is almost winning for white, so it's probably black can't go for this d4 pawn, they have to do something else, but then it's a completely different game. Also, white could have simply played bishop to e5 to deal with this pressure on the on the pawn, and not yet considered in the center. Because in the game, Steinitz played d takes c5, which after d takes e5, is pro the problem is twofold. You now have given black some mobility in the center. You have re re removed your pawn that was giving you space. And also this queen is now uh, attacking the b2 pawn and now it's active because with the pawn on b6, the queen was kind of passive, but now it's been activated and there is problems with the b2 pawn. It's not yet um, the end of the world, but now suddenly white doesn't have any real claims to fight for an advantage. It actually has to be a little bit careful. So after knight e5, c4, uh, it's a really good move because the d4 square is weakened, but now this bishop is severely restricted. It has to go to b1 because on b, uh, c2 you lose the pawn. So b1, bishop b1, bishop d7, rook d7, d1, bishop d7. Now uh, the bishop is maybe going to a4 to harass the, the knight. It is true the, that you can uh, that it gives up uh, the bishop pair potentially, but after something like queen d7, rook d7, 
this bishop is not selective and this knight is perfectly placed potentially at some moment d4 might come and actually it's not at all clear whether white wants to give this nice knight for this bishop that's not doing much and the, which is restricted by these pawns on white squares so after queen to f3 uh, which was played again this is maybe the first step in the wrong direction uh, white is attacking these two pawns but white is leaving the b2 pawn undefended maybe it's better to play h3 and just keep the position as it is i mean 97 is also playable but it's not entirely clear what's happening here but okay queen f3 bishop e8 simply defending the pawn and also this pawn and now comes the actually the crucial moment of the game so here what white should do white should probably play like rook to e2 or something uh, and then keep the position going. It is true that, for example, black has some resources like d4, when after you, knight c4 it's a little bit dangerous to capture this pawn because bishop b5 is an annoying pin. But maybe you can also play something like rook to d2, and then take it from there, because now this uh, there is this pin, so d4 is not possible. So yeah, it was a pretty equal position, but yeah, one that's not super easy to play, especially for white. But somehow, for some reason, Steinitz here hallucinated and made another big mistake, almost even worse than the mistake we have seen in, last, in the last game. So Steinitz played this knight c4 move, trying to kind of exploit this pin on the queen. But the problem is after d takes c4, this is just called shower, because now the queen is immune because of the big, big weak back rank, which is why maybe playing h3 earlier was a good idea. And now you can't do anything. If you play queen to b7, then rook d1 is losing. And if rook d8, which seems logical, like an intermediate move, now if queen f3, you have a rook e8 check. But the problem is, after rook to d8, then there is knight to d8. And maybe this is what Steinitz missed, that after this exchange, the queen would be protected on, on, on b7. So after queen to e2, uh, knight e6, okay, Steinitz made one more move and he resigned because, yeah, there is nothing... Uh, Nothing going on, there is, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's just a piece down. So yeah, quite a shocking turn of events, uh, especially since before the match, as I said, Zuckertort was considered to be the combination of genius, and yet he was here outplaying Steinitz from quiet equal positions time and time again. Uh, so yeah, even though Steinitz blundered here, actually Zuckertort didn't prove to be inferior player in this uh, maneuvering, slow and quiet play. And thus, after yet another blunder by Steinitz, Zuckertort increased the lead and was now leading by two points in the match. We will see what happens in the following videos that will cover the rest of the match. If you haven't checked them yet, make sure to check the videos on the first three games of the match which are available on the channel. Also, if you like this content, make sure to check some of the other content of the channel. It's not all historical nerdy chess blabbering, there is some something that is a little bit different and maybe of some value to somebody. If you like the channel, make sure to subscribe and uh, yeah, uh, share it with friends. Uh, and if not, well, thank you for watching the video anyway, and I will be hoping and looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks once again and see you soon. Bye-bye.